Hey, good evening. It's Friday, April 29th. It's uh, the first edition of Q&A Friday. Our second video of the day, but the first of Q&A Friday. Thanks so much for those of you who sent in your questions, and we'll see how it goes. And if there's a good response and it's helpful to you all, let me know, and maybe we'll try again in a couple of weeks. But uh, thankfully, I answer your questions. we got a few here. So I'll read uh, the question the brief identifier of the person, and we'll see where we go. First one, help me now, 150, ask the question. Explain the priestly line which led to Jesus. Thinking about the genealogies between and Matthew and Luke, how were they chosen? And mentions about brothers in the same family that are not chosen, some questions there. And it is, it's a, it's a challenging issue. Uh, the genealogies in the two Gospels do radically differ. And that presents some problems. Matthew begins with Abraham. Luke, with his 77 names, goes all the way back to Adam. So different names appear in each because they each pick up a different line. Uh, it's potentially confusing, but I believe it's probably not productive to make too much of the differences except to know that the Holy Spirit wants us to see the careful attention given to the recording of Christ's human, human lineage. Remember that Paul warns us not to make a big deal and get hung up on genealogies and lists and issues and back and forth. And I think that's the good, good line here. We can just trust that this two different lines, with all the problems that they present, are the problems come from our side, not from God's side. So we can trust God in this area. I think that's a wise path to take. What is important to note is that both focus on Jesus. He is our Savior and our King. That's the point of both of those genealogies. They give us a different perspective, but they point to the same person. So that kind of doesn't delve into all the different challenges that are there, but it assumes that we can trust the Holy Spirit. And that these genealogies are there for us to get a full grasp of Christ. And that, most importantly, whether from Abraham, the father of our faith, or Adam, the beginning of the human race, they both terminate on Jesus. And that's a good message for us to walk away from. And again, if you have any thoughts, you know, get back to me if that's not satisfying, or we can look at it again. But I think that's the answer that's most satisfying to me, and that's about all I can give you, so... I hope that's helpful. Connie asks, two questions from Connie, both great questions. She wants to know about thoughts for euthanasia for the terminally ill who are suffering horribly and want to end their misery. It's a huge question in our day because of our medical technologies, the ability to keep life going, assuming from that. But what we have to recognize is that our culture is drifting increasingly away from a biblical worldview and fear of God. We have forgotten that all of our days are numbered by God, that life is his issue, not ours to decide. Some try and do anything and everything to try and prolong life at any cost, at great expense, at great pain, and great agony. I don't think that's what God wants us to be about. Others want to end life when they think best. They want to end life on their terms. But you see, the end of life is God's call, not ours. Psalm 139 makes that clear. Jesus makes that clear. Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? In Psalm 139, the hours, the days, the time, the minute is recorded on God. He knows what's best. So suffering must be seen in this context of trusting God and calling for him to be merciful. We have come to believe that God is not a part of this decision regarding the end of life and euthanasia. But what this does is it opens the door to other people deciding for us when it is your time. Are you too expensive to keep alive? Is it you're not worth keeping alive? Or we're going to keep you alive whether you want to or not, instead of giving it over to God and trusting Him. The other downside is to recognize that the reality that euthanasia and 
abortion all come, both come from the same philosophical root, that man can determine life when it ends and begins and not God. So in that sense, euthanasia is not a helpful perspective. We need to be able to trust God for these things. So we don't want to prolong life needlessly or fight a fight that shouldn't be fought because we can't bear the idea of dying. But neither do we want to deny the fact that God can help us in our suffering. And we need to have a bigger, broader view of faithfulness of God in our time. I hope that's helpful. Then Connie asked a second question. When a saved person passes away, I'm not clear on whether they will immediately go to heaven or not until Jesus returns. Again, another great question. And the issue is, when Jesus does return, there will be a reuniting of the body and the soul together into a new glorified body. That will happen at the final resurrection. But the good news is, in the meantime, we will be, we will be in an intermediate state, but we will be with Jesus. And we will know the joy of what it means to be with Jesus. And then when the final resurrection comes, there will be that great uniting of, of body and soul all over again. But the cool, blessed hope is that when we die as believers, as Paul says, as Jesus says, we will be with the Lord. So that's our hope. So don't get thrown off by the fact that this intermediate state exists. It's confusing at times, but it's all good because we'll be with Christ. So again, two great questions. Laura asks for my thoughts on Christ's return and the times we're living in. Uh, or, as you know, that's a huge question, and there's endless amounts of speculation and debate and what people think about this and various eschatological perspectives. However, Jesus does address the issue in Acts chapter 1. So, right at the beginning of, of the chapter, when the, the apostles all came together just before Christ's ascension, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom of Israel to Israel at this time? And Jesus says very plainly, it is not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to all the ends of the earth. So what we don't know is what we don't know. That no one will know the day or the hour, the time that Jesus, the Father, is set by his own authority. And yet somehow we insist on the fact that we have to know. And Jesus says, we can't know. There was endless speculation around 1988, connected to when Israel became a nation again, that maybe that was the 40-year period and Jesus would come back. Well, we're 40 years, well, almost 40 years to that point. Lord has it come back. We don't know the day or the hour. And I believe it's, again, not helpful to try and speculate that because God has not given us the answer that we need. But we know that he will come back when the time is right. We do know from Colossians 1 and other passages that we are a part of Christ's kingdom right now. We have been rescued from the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of his dear son, where Jesus is reigning and ruling, according to Colossians 1, 15 to 20. Jesus is ruling right now. And he's in control. He is King Jesus. So I find great comfort in that. So there are many, many conflicting views, many different views of eschatology. But I believe the safest guide is to follow Christ's instruction and rejoice that we have been rescued and brought out of the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light and of his dear son. And when the time is ready, the Lord will come back and everything will be in just as it should. So without getting into more deeply in that, that's the answer that's most satisfying to me and doesn't, again, draw us into endless fights and controversy, which I think we need to avoid. Zoe asks, what is the best thing one can do to help a loved one who is grieving? I mean, that's a hard one because 
grief is such a overwhelming thing and a difficult thing. But there are answers. I think the Psalms are the best place to go. I don't know the exact nature of the grief that you're talking about, uh, but I can still point you and me to the Psalms and this whole issue of this category of Psalms of lament. Lament is the largest category of the Psalms. There are more songs about lament than any other type of Psalm. And I actually did a play, playlist uh, of several videos on laments, and maybe you can look that up and maybe they'll find a specific, you'll find a specific answer there. If not, you know, message me back in the comment section and I can address that. But those laments in the Psalms are there to bring comfort to us. And you can find comfort there as well. It's a really, really good thing. And the fact that the Lord gave so much time to lament means that he understands our pain and our suffering. We do know from places like Hebrews 2 and 4 that Jesus was tempted and suffered in every way that we have been suffered. And the one, your loved one, is suffering. And he's there to help us in our time of need. So that's an encouragement. It's a huge encouragement. So check out those those playlists, those, those uh, videos. And uh, again, if something more specific, just comment and we'll get back to you. Last question. Last question on this uh, Q&A, first issue of Q&A Friday. Joan says, I have tried to be a peacemaker between two adult loved ones who have been estranged for many, many years, and neither of them is interested in reconciling with the other. Should I just give up trying other than praying? We're all believers. Joan, sadly, this is not an uncommon question or occurrence. It's a sad thing for the Church of Christ that this is so common. And it's, it's not what God's called us to. It's not helpful at all that we do this. So you don't have to give up in the sense of giving up on God or the truth. But once you've spoken the truth as plainly as you can to each party, you can then continue just to pray for them and be a good example. Show them Christ in the way that you act towards them. Be faithful in the way that you love them. And, but refuse to get drawn into, you know, well, I can't believe it. I mean, how, how many years they've been doing this. So don't get drawn into the back and forth. Just whenever it comes up, not in a nasty or pedantic way, point them back to Christ and say, you know that Jesus is greater than your problems. And you don't need to say any more than that. And pray that at one point, one of them may come to you and say, you know what? I'm tired of living like this. Would you help me? And pray to God to work that. But you can't do the whole work of the Holy Spirit. But you can, in a way that is gentle and gracious, show them the beauty of Christ. And of course, as you said, continue to pray. And I pray that this situation, which is far too common, would come to an end. So that's it. Those are the first questions from uh, Q&A Friday, the first edition. Uh, I enjoyed the chance to take a look at them and uh, give you some answers. I hope these things were helpful to you. And probably many of you, others of you have the same types of questions. And so again, let me know what you think of uh, Q&A Friday. And uh, we can certainly do it again if it's something that you're uh, interested in. And, uh, again, thanks so much for being here. Check us out at EverydayTalk247.com. If you haven't turned on post notifications, do that. The videos will come right to you. Uh, again, so much. appreciate your encouragement, your comments, and just the opportunity to go through these questions tonight. What a, what a cool thing. So, uh, again, thanks for being here. I really enjoyed this, this time. And, uh, Lord willing, maybe in a couple of weeks we'll do it again. You have a great evening. And, again, by his will, we'll see you in the morning. You have a great day. Bye-bye.